Africa is needy. Africa needs our help to solve its problems. You'd be surprised to know that this is the way that we have dealt with Africa for over 200 years, ever since the colonial days. We see Africa as coming to us with hands extended, wanting help, and we give them charity. But do we see Africa the way it really is? Is this the best way to deal with Africa? How effective has this approach been? Let's look at the evidence. 82% of Africans are still living on less than $4 per day. Over 25% of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are poorer now than they were in 1960, with no indication that more aid is going to get them out of poverty. The World Bank calculates that between 1981 and 2010, the number of poor people in the world fell by about 700 million. But out of that, China was responsible for 90%, and they had little to no help. Whatever we have been doing and doing and doing in Africa has not worked. The reality is that Africa has an immense wealth of mineral resources. For instance, the untapped mineral reserves just of the Democratic Republic of Congo amount to an astronomical $24 trillion. Unfortunately, these natural resources are being exploited by colonial powers and Africa's elite. So we don't know exactly how much of this is going to end up benefiting Africa. Multinational corporations are taking profits that they make in Africa and taking them back to their home countries. African elite have put away as much as $500 billion in offshore accounts which amounts to about 30% of Africa's wealth. In fact, many people would argue that more is being taken out of Africa than is being put back in, to the tune of about $41 billion a year. However, there is a resource that is even more valuable, that is being neglected and squandered away even more recklessly than its natural resources, and that is Africa's youth. It's human resources, it's human potential. For instance, a student from Moy University in Kenya devised some and wrote a software for the mobile market which allowed people to send and receive and withdraw money from their mobile devices. Safaricom bought the rights for that. And now M-Pesa is one of the largest and most popular money transfer services in the developing world. And even more advanced than anything we, that we have in the West, But first, before we talk about that further, let me introduce you to young 14-year-old William Kampamba from Malawi. William went to his local library and found some books. And in those books, he learned about how to build a windmill. But you see, he couldn't understand the long English words, the technical words. So he just looked at the pictures. And from the pictures, he figured out how things work. And now the next challenge was to get the materials but the materials weren't available. So what he did was he went to the local junkyard to see what he could find. And as you can see, he found an old bicycle. He found some tubes, he found some wood. He found things that were in his particular environment that made sense to him, and he built the windmill. William represents the ingenuity of Africa's youth. If he had access to the internet, He'd probably play Fortnite for about three or four hours, like my 15-year-old son would do. And then he'd build windows. But he would build in the way that made sense to him, with the materials that he had available within his particular environment. In other words, he would improvise. You see, I believe that all of the UN Sustainable Development Goals can be better addressed when we empower African youth. William brought electricity to his house, which gave them light, which made those, the household more productive. He powered two radios, which made the household more informed. He provided power for villagers, and so they started to line up outside his house to charge their cell phone, which helped them become more connected. He even built another windmill for irrigation purposes, because his family were maize farmers. So by my count, 
William touched about maybe 10 of these sustainable goals. Now imagine what all the Williams of Africa could do. So we have understood the digital divide as a division between those who have technology and those who don't, or between those who have access to the internet and those who don't. This is a very simplistic interpretation. This conceptualization is leading us into a debate in which there is no clear winner. On the one side of the debate, you have those like Mark Zuckerberg, who says that access to the internet should be a human right, just like access to water or access to healthcare. On the other side of the debate, you have those like Commissioner O'Reilly of the FCC, who argue that people can and do live without internet access, and many lead very successful lives. Instead, the term necessity should be reserved to those items that humans cannot live without, such as food, shelter, and water. So the debate is centered on access to the internet and whether a human being can live without it. So with a quick applause, because I can't really see any of you, uh, how many of you think that access to the internet should be a human right, just like food, shelter, or water? Okay, how many of you feel that it should not be in the same category as food, shelter, or water? I'm glad that I got that response because it makes my next point. You see, a mixed reaction tells me that there will be no consensus for years to come. I think we're asking the wrong question. We should not be asking, should access to the internet be a human right just like access to food or water? This is a wrong comparison to make. These things are obviously not equal. If I take away your food or water, eventually you're going to die. If I take away your internet, well, my three children would say they would die, <laughs> but besides that, um, you'd probably be less connected. You see, we are wired to connect. How else do you explain the meteoric rise in popularity of the smartphone? There's only been in widespread commercial production for less than 10 years. Even in the classroom, students are attached to their laptops. And the connection that they, their laptops bring, I always try to get students to leave their laptops at home and come into class in a disconnected state, God forbid. But I always fail miserably. And now I know why. I'm going against thousands of years of evolution. Science explains our tendency to want to be always connected. Technology is a form of digital drug, kind of like cocaine. The midbrain mid neurons release dopamine, and that uh, kind of makes sure that the behavior will likely be repeated. We also have mirror neurons, which support social thinking and empathy. So when someone is speaking, we tend to mimic what they're doing. Like for instance, when Shannon had her speech, and she got to some of the more gut-wrenching parts, we start to feel that within us, that those are mirror neurons that are firing. And in fact, those neurons are active when the brain is resting, which makes sense as our ancestors needed to understand which of the other humans were friend and which were foe. So add all this to the fact that dopamine gets released when we use technology, which makes our media so addictive. So you see, evolution has hardwired us to constantly seek connection. The internet is an enabler of that connection. And it's through the internet that we are empowered to better engage in global citizenship. So what is global citizenship? Well, Nicholas Negroponte from MIT says, the information superhighway is more than just a shortcut to every book in the Library of Congress. It is creating a totally new global social fabric. So members of this global social fabric, or what Marshall McLuhan identified in the 1960s as the global village, see the world as one unified community. They strive to fight inequality and inequity. They learn from other cultures. They advocate for vulnerable populations. These are some of the qualities of a global citizen. And I would like to now show you a three examples of global citizenship at work. So first of all, change.org. It works in about 196 countries in Canada. I'm oh, sorry, 196 countries. In Canada, it got plastic bands banned in Victoria, with close to 30,000 signatures. It forced protection of orphan bear clubs, cubs in Alberta with about 37,000 signatures. 
It even influenced Starbucks to develop a fully recyclable cup with over 350,000 signatures. And that project was actually started by two girls who were doing a school project at, at, in school. Globalcitizen.org. They've already impacted close to 700 million lives, and they have projects set up to impact a total of about a staggering 2 billion lives. They have attained around 390 commitments and over 13 million actions. What they do is they mobilize youth all over the world by letting them earn points for doing acts of global citizenship. And then this youth can then take those points and they can redeem them for concerts and things like that. The third is Avaaz.org. They describe themselves as a global web movement to bring people, power, politics, to decision-making everywhere. The Guardian says that Avaaz is only five years old, but has exploded to become the global's largest and most powerful online activist network. They note on their website that they campaign in 15 languages, served by 14 of six, and also uh, served by 14 on six different continents and thousands of volunteers. The key point is that they have made it super easy to write your petition and start whatever campaign you want. So it is the internet that empowers everyday citizens to inspire positive transformation all over the world. So, coming back to my opening, Africa is not poor. Africa is not easy. Africa does not need our help to solve its problems. If we want to help, the question we should be asking is how do we help empower Africa? I submit to you that the best way to do this is by helping them to provide internet access for all. Which will help them solve their own problems and dare I say become global citizens to help solve others' problems too. Now, I want to introduce you to the future of Africa. Asheshi University, on the outskirts of Accra in Ghana, was started by an ex-Microsoft engineer, Patrick Oua, to address the leadership crisis in Africa, and in a very short time was known as one of the most elite universities within sub-Saharan Africa. I had very high expectation when I was going there. And we rented a van, and we, were, we kind of drove along the road, and at some point, we all of a sudden took a turn. And for about 40 minutes, we traveled along a road, and I use, use the word road very loosely, because it was like back-to-back -back speed bumps. I thought I'd need a spinal readjustment when I got to my destination. And I'm actually thankful for road works once I see road like that. But anyway, so we took this road and went 40 minutes and traveled to uh, Asheshi University. And what we wanted to know was that we have a joint force that was run between Laurier and Asheshi. And we wanted to understand, you know, during that joint course, there were problems with transmission. So when we got to talking with them, we were astounded to find out that their internet access came from one particular tower. And the bandwidth they had was about equal to what you or I have in our houses. And this was for the whole university of about 200 plus students, plus faculty and staff that had to share one small internet connection. And it was very expensive to get internet through wireless means. But the reason for that was because they asked the telecom company to wire them up. And the telecom company said, well, the problem is that road is not built yet. If we put the lay down the wire along that road, it's going to keep on getting cut, and it's going to be very expensive for us to come back and keep on fixing it. So the government's responsibility was to fix the road. The government came and announced we're going to fix the road, but two years had passed and they hadn't shown up. So I tell this story in my class to, to explain to students how difficult it is sometimes to get internet access in Africa. And in fact, Asheshi University had to shut down the entire internet for the whole university at the time when the joint course was being run. So now imagine what students at Asheshi were some of the best and brightest in the whole region, or 
as the many other Sheshis across Africa could do with better internet access? What kind of knowledge would they be exposed to? And what kind of changes would they be, would they be able to affect in their home countries? Give a man or woman a fish, feed them for a day. Teach a man or woman to fish, feed them for a lifetime. But if you give a man or woman or child the internet, enable them to teach themselves how to fish in the way that makes sense to them, in the context within which they live, and empower them to become good global citizens by teaching others to fish in ways that make sense to them. I'll leave you with a quote of the great Nelson Mandela who once said, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. We are wired to connect, and it is through a simple internet connection in an increasingly disconnected world that we're really able to achieve our full human potential. We are wired to connect, and it is connection we seek, because connection enables our humanity. It is only now, in the long arc of evolution, that our social technologies have become advanced enough to afford that connection through global citizenship. By depriving people of their ability to connect, we are denying them their right to be empowered to solve their own problems and their right to make their contribution to the global village. So whether that be in remote parts of Africa or in our very own Canadian backyard, I urge you all to see what you can do to help others attain internet access. You see, we are all African. We are all Canadian. And we all have the right to become citizens of the global village. Access to the internet inspires positive transformation. And it is through this access that we can finally begin to address all of the world's problems. And together, realize our own humanity. Thank you.